morning church and uh, thank you so very much hasni for reading the scripture for me and that will be the theme scripture for my sermon the title of my sermon today is mediation of christ mediation of christ as priest king and prophet shorter form of westminster's confession westminster's catechism has so many questions and question number 23 reads what offices does christ execute as our redeemer and the answer reads christ as our redeemer executed the office of a prophet of a priest and of a king both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation and it is very common and you might have heard several times many preachers and teachers teaching that christ is doing three offices three works at this present day that is he is working as a priest he is working as a prophet as well as the king we call christ as priest prophet and king because that is the way the bible presents him in the early church christians took these three great archetypes from the old testament and used them to interpret christ when jesus has come and was teaching and uh, from the scripture and claimed himself as the son of god and died buried and resurrected on the third day the church believed in him and the church started to understand christ by looking at the old testament scriptures and church started interpreting the ministry of jesus church started interpreting the life and identity of jesus through the old testament scriptures and as they are interpreting they have chosen these three archetypes to interpret and understand jesus and as well as to preach him uh, in the gospel <coughs> and those are priest prophet and king and the early church read him re relentlessly through the lens of the old testament and if we want to understand jesus in a textual uh, in a textual biblical way we must come to terms with these three categories if you want to understand jesus according to the old testament scriptures we need to see him through these three archetypes and we have to understand him in uh, through these um offices and ministries and we all know that jesus is called christ what is the meaning of the word christ and luke says the word christ means the anointed one jesus is the anointed one uh, the according to luke and that is the meaning of the word christ who are the anointed people in the old testament and primarily we understand there are three types of people who were anointed in the old testament number one are priests priests were anointed and number two prophets were anointed and number three kings were anointed that is the very reason and that that is a very reason it is uh, imperative for us to understand when we call jesus as christ in the terms of old testament anointed ones that is priest prophet and kings the anointed ones in the old testament they they give a, a understanding of jesus and jesus ministry all the old testament ministry was done by these three categories of offices only and <coughs> and you don't find anything else from genesis uh till malachi we will find these three offices as early church christians called jesus as christ they were saying he is the definitive priest and definitive prophet and definitive king as i said old testament anointed uh, offices of priest prophet and king are the archetypes those are the symbolic uh symbol symbolic pictures and uh, symbol uh, images of jesus christ ministry and jesus is the definitive of those offices and those persons so if we talk about a priest 
Old Testament gives a shadow of the priest and Jesus acts like a true priest. And if you talk about a king, Old Testament gives us a picture, uh, image of a king and Jesus acts and executes his authority like a true king. And if you talk about prophet, Old Testament gives us a picture of a prophet and Jesus acts as a true prophet and the message of the prophet. There's a whole series of Old Testament Christ. You must be uh, feeling quite difficult to accept this word, Old Testament Christ. Christ is the only one where this Old Testament Christ have come. These Old Testament Christ are nothing but the anointed figures who are priests, prophets, and kings. That we are taking the literal meaning, the meaning of the word Christ. And I'm going to follow a method called Malcolm Miller's method, that is reading Christ in the light of the Old Testament Christ, the Old Testament anointed ones. And every believer of Jesus is also a Christ. You know, the word Christians, it is first used in Antioch. We can find it in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And uh, there it reads, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The Christians means little Christ or ones like Christ, people who are like Christ or the little Christ. So if we are a, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, you are also a Christ. A little Christ may not be the savior uh, like Jesus Christ, but we are just like him. That's what the very meaning of the word Christians. So through faith and baptism in Christ, we share in the offices of Jesus Christ, which is priest, prophet, and king. Jesus is our definitive priest, prophet, and king. And through faith in him and uh, through baptism, we are joining in his office of Christ, which is be acting like a priest, prophet, and king that we are going to explore in the rest of the sermon. And as much as we understand Jesus in this perspective, we come to understand ourselves because we are also placed in the same office, in the same ministry of Jesus Christ. And we are also called to partake in the ministry of of Jesus Christ. God made us as partners of his, um, of his kingdom and he made us ambassadors of his kingdom. And we are going to be hands and feet of Jesus Christ and his office and his mission. So because we are little Christ or who look like Christ, so we are partaking in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read these things and I'm going to explain my sermon uh, and I'm going to look at some Old Testament pictures, not in a bibliological manner, but I'm going to take more in political and narrative manner, which is not wrong, which is uh, highly read in the uh, uh, early church. A lot of people read Old Testament scriptures uh, as a narrative and they read it poetically. So I'm going to take it in this perspective. Uh, the reason I'm not taking by, by bibliological perspective is because it is very common and most of us, we know the answers. We all can give a bunch of scripture portions, scripture references the moment we talk about uh, uh, these three ministries of Jesus Christ. We have so many resources about it. So I would like to take the, uh, uh, another, path, another path which many of uh, early church fathers have taken, that is reading some of these Old Testament characters and pictures in poetical and narrative manner. Let us look at priest. What is the office of the priest? The office of the priest is to perform sacrifices, whether it is thanksgiving or atonement or any other kind. Priests are the people who are offering sacrifices. And priest always tries to bring the divine and the human together. Why the priest offers sacrifice? The priest offers a sacrifice so that there may be peace in between God and humans. So that God and human can be brought together. Humans, because of the guilt, they are not feeling comfortable. They are scared to go into the presence of God. That is where the priest offers the sacrifices so that people may be 
may have a sense of confidence to come before the throne of God. So through this sacrificial ministry, the priest always tries to bring the people and God together. And these are like reconcile, sorry, uh, counselors. They try to reconcile people and God. They try to unite God and people. And who is the first prophet in the Old Testament? Probably we may say Aaron. Aaron is the first person who was appointed as prophet. Yeah, of course, Aaron is a prophet appointed by God according to the law of Moses. But many rabbis and many uh, early church fathers and even some of uh, Southern Baptist preachers and some Catholic fathers, they read <coughs> that Adam before the fall is the first priest. There are so many resources about it. Adam before the fall, he acted as the first priest. You may ask this question. Adam did not perform any sacrifice as others. Then how can he be a prophet? Uh, sorry, how can he be a priest? As I said previously, the work of the priest is to bring God and humans together, to unite, to bring them together. Even the word, look at the word atonement. Atonement means at one moment, bringing oneness, bringing togetherness. That is the meaning of the word atonement also. And uh, uh, so priests bring God and humans together. And Adam in the Eden Garden, we all know that he has a very close and uh, easy friendship with God. We, we read in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 that God was coming to the Eden Garden in the cool of the day so that they, he can walk with Adam. We can see a very clear and very good easy fellowship with between Adam and God. They are in a very close relationship. They were together in a good friendship. And uh, we all know the word adoration. And the etymology of the word adoration, it is uh, an, a Latin word. And uh, Pope Benedict, he gives the etymology like this. This adoration, the uh, Latin word adoratia, uh, adora adoratia uh, which means a very strong love, which is more like a mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss. Adoration is of an intimate relationship. Almost it is like an exchange of mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss. This can happen only in a very close intimate relationships. As soon as we talk about mouth-to-mouth -mouth kisses and uh, these kind of adoration, and we will be reminded about Song of Solomon. Songs of Solomon starts with these kind of expression. Songs of Solomon, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, it reads, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Of course, uh, some interpretations say it is, the, it is explaining about the love between uh, a man and woman. And also, even the, one of the most prominent and traditional and uh, uh, classic way of reading the scripture uh, he, he indicates that this is talking about the relationship between God and his people. And it is talking about, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth, showing about the kind of adoration in between God and his people. This is a love song, but it is also traditionally interprets as soul singing to God. It is singing for union that the soul might be in mouth to mouth with God. A soul, a human is coming in such a close, intimate relationship with God as a mouth-to-mouth -mouth relationship. This means that breathing the very life of God, where our life completely, uh, completely aligns with God. So when we come into such close proximity, we will be breathing the other person. So when we are in adoration, when we come to such intimacy with God, we will be breathing his very life. Where his life will be, uh, will be uh, we will be inhaling his life and our life will be aligning 
with his life and his desires will become our desires and our desires will be merged with his desires that is the adoration the bible is talking about that is the adoration that is the kind of relationship adam was with god before the fall and that is the very work of the priests priests are trying to bring god and humans together into such intimacy and since adam has done that that's why we are considering him as the priest and the great desire of god if we find in the entire bible is to bring his people to right worship with him in other words the right worship which means into this adoration in this intimate relationship if you read from genesis till revelation everywhere we can see the heart of god that god wants to bring his children and his people into to cl- his close proximity and he wants to bring bring them into his arms and uh, have an intimate relationship with him and in fact god does not need our prayers and our praises but we need to praise god because in that great act we become aligned and reconciled unto god in the sense of this adoration it is not that god needs it but god wants it and for us it is that we, it is very important for us and we need it to come to that adoration because where the life of god will be imparted into us and our lives will be aligned to him and if you see in the old the new testament now jesus as the only god man and divine person he is completely divine he is completely human he is 100% man 100% <clears throat> god embodied god embodied in human flesh in the incarnation he brought a complete union between god and man in his very incarnation he brought god and man to such a close intimacy and unity where they cannot be separated and uh, uh and as he is being seated at the right hand of god he is offering our prayers supplications and adoration to god as a human and he is expressing the divine love towards us uh, as god in the human flesh so jesus as 100% god and man he brought the absolute unity between humanity and divinity where the true worship a true adoration from humans is offered to god in his very body uh, as he is seated on the heavenly places previously only we studied about ascension and pentecost and this is the ministry that jesus is doing presently jesus as our worship leader he is being seated in the heavenly places and offering our adoration to god and jesus as a priest he is offering the mercy and forgiveness and the love of god towards us that is the work that jesus is doing uh, as a priest he made this uh, intimate adoration possible just as the prodigal son and the father experienced in the parable where the father fell on the son and kissed him you remember the story the son returned the, the moment father saw the son he ran to the son and he fell on his neck and started kissing him and hugging him and uh, he expressed his love towards him they, they, that is the kind of love that is the kind of adoration that jesus has set we we humans and god uh, is uh, such a adoration he set in between humans and god as a priest and that is that is a priestly ministry of jesus christ just like adam was in such a close relationship in adoration with god and jesus brought us back to that position but unfortunately adam failed and he had to leave the garden but jesus christ has taken all of us back to the presence of god and he made all of us seated in the heavenly places as the author of uh, colossians the point in colossians apostle paul says we have been seated in the heavenly places in jesus christ 
and how are we seated in heavenly places it is just like in the genesis sorry in john chapter 1 verse 1 it reads in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the word was with god the true translation is the word is in face to face with god and we being seated in heavenly places and we being seated with jesus bringing us in face to face with god in such adoration so that is the priestly ministry of jesus christ and jesus is acting like a king also let us look at the, uh, the old testament archetypes for uh, the king kingship of jesus christ we find in the new testament that jesus is called the son of david being called son of david it is uh, revealing his royalty and the fashion after whom the kingship would be what kind of kingship that jesus is going to exercise that is going to be that is been explained through this very statement jesus being called as a son of god of course i understand the genealogy of the line and all are there as i told you we are not reading it in bibliographical bibliological manner but we are trying to read it in more poetical or narrative manner so the title son of god son of david is showing what manner of kingship that jesus is going to exercise the whole bible is uh, based around this theme and having david as a, as in the center and backwards adam and the uh, forward jesus david is in the center in this entire na- narrative in backwards if you look at who is the other king we can see about that is adam adam is placed in the eden garden to rule the garden humans are created to rule the creation and to protect the creation and to uh, to uh, subdue and take it over that is the work of the king the role of a king is to unite establish and to enlarge a king has to unite people he has to establish people and he and his kingdom and he has to enlarge so david is this, is in the center and in the backwards we have adam and the forward we have jesus what is the kind of kingship that david have done we are trying to boil down his entire life and he started his kingship uh, we can find that references in second samuel chapter 5 verse 1 to 3 all the tribe of tribes of israel came to david at hebron and said we are your own flesh and blood in the past while saul was a king over us you were uh, you were the one who led israel on their military campaigns and the lord said to you you will shepherd my people israel and you will become their ruler when all the elders of israel had come to the king david at hebron the king made a covenant with them at hebron before the lord and they anointed david king over israel you all know this uh, story very well david was not the king of israel uh, for all the 12 tribes from the beginning he got favor from and favor and acceptance from only two tribes benjamin and judah and later at the at the death of uh, <coughs> saul the remaining 10 tribes came and joined david so the first act of david as a king is to unite people together he brought the 10 tribes and the two tribes together and what is the next thing he did the next immediate thing david did is declaring jerusalem as the capital politically and primarily the religious capital we all can see the t- temple uh, sorry the tabernacle has been pitched in jerusalem and david was dancing in front of the ark of the covenant he set a religious and a, a political uh, capital that is in jerusalem the house of god that is where G- uh, david he set the kingdom and then after establishing these he started enlarging the kingdom so first he united the kingdom and then he established 
in the faith and in pol politically and in religiously, religiously and then he started expanding the kingdom on the other hand adam he failed to be a king actually he was a bad example for a bad king he should be bringing unity and you know what happened right after the fall he brought there is a division there is a disunity between adam and eve in their own words they they, they uh, adam blaming the eve and all we can see there we cannot find the unity in them and which continued from then till now and then adam has to protect the garden but he failed to do that he supposed to establish but he failed to do that and he let corruption take over the garden and he did not enlarge but unfortunately he had to step out of the garden garden adam he is setting an example for a bad kingship on the other hand jesus he is not just uniting the 10 tribes of israel israel but he is uniting the entire world all the tribes of the world as a good king and he united all of us and wherever a right praise is established a divine and lively culture that flourishes just like the garden of eden in the garden of eden when adam was uh, before the fall adam was in good relationship with god a good culture has been built the the garden was flourishing and the moment he failed he brought corruption in and adam was kicked out of it but one thing clearly we could see where a true right praise is there a good culture lively and godly culture being established around it and david made jerusalem jerusalem was uh, it was not a big city the moment david chose and he brought the temple and he established as political kingdom since then around jerusalem a culture a culture of god's people has been developed and it has spread so now jesus he united all of us and around us he is building the uh, a, a culture and he is building uh, he is bringing his kingdom values into this world if you see anywhere in the world wherever christians went wherever the missionaries went to the villages the growth that was taking place wherever the missionaries went they established schools and hospitals and around them the place changes the entire second bad area look at it second bad area developed because of the railways and second thing is because of the churches and lots of place we all know where these missionaries have come the culture has developed the place has developed that is how he is bringing the uh, i mean we are bringing the values of christ into the world the role of a priest king is to establish the right praise and uh, that is bringing all together and the moment the right praise comes and this culture and kingdom values will be spread Adam as a priest king failed to keep the kingdom in unity and failed to protect by allowing corruption inside and finally he had to step out of the borders David as a priest king united the king and uh, united the king and set the culture around him Jesus as the king of Israel and who also as the high priest in his own body becomes the right praise to God that is what he is doing we just discussed before in the heavens is being seated in the heavenly places and church is the mystical body of Christ by this means through ups and downs in the centuries God wants to draw all people into right praise into union in Jesus all tribes of the world were united and throughout the history we have seen in through all these centuries through this mystical body of christ and god is setting his kingdom values in in this world and we always pray that let your kingdom come in the uh, in the right praise we uh, uh, in the right praise that means in adoration when we <coughs> when we breathe from the breath of god in adoration as we discussed 
mouth to mouth his will his way will be our way and our will and so that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven through this mystical body bringing the all people together he is uh, and bringing these people in right uh, praise with god in adoration with god in such an intimate relationship with god his kingdom values have been executed and may have been established through this mystical body that is how jesus is acting and doing his ministry as a king and the third ministry of jesus is the prophet jesus is the prophet that moses spoke about and what is the ministry what is the work of the prophets the very work of the prophets is to be the mouth of god they speak to bring people back into right place with god or adoration if you read the old testament always the message of uh, prophets will be either correcting them to live according to the law of god so that they can come close to god and they ask they ask people to repent and come close to god or comforting them saying that god is very close to you either asking them to come close to god or saying god has come close to you and he will be coming close to you and sometimes this would be a message for the present sometimes this would be a message for the future so but ultimately what prophets are doing is again bringing god and his people together into the right place with god i have chosen uh, the we read the words hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 hearts need him and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed uh, heir of all things through whom also he made the world worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high if you read these three verses and the three offices of jesus have been mentioned here that is the very reason we read this and we chose this as uh, the theme verse for my sermon and uh, but now what we are going to take from this is about the prophet god has spoken to our fathers through prophets and but in the last days he spoke to us through his son jesus christ the work of the prophets is to be the mouthpiece of god to bring god and man together and uh, when it comes to jesus see jesus is not just the mouthpiece of god but jesus is the very message of god this this we have to understand this and john chapter 12 verse 49 it says for i have not spoken on my own authority but the father who sent me gave me the command what i should say and what i should speak whatever god had given that is what i am giving it to you just like the prophets prophets whatever they receive that's they give uh, gave to people and jesus said i am doing the same and then he goes on and says uh, in john uh, he goes on and john we read that he is the the very word of god himself he is not just the person who is delivering the message but he himself is the very message of god and he himself is revealing the father's heart to us so jesus is acting like the perfect and definite definitive prophet uh, as the word of god who came in flesh and and his what is the goal of his ministry that we can understand in the prayer that jesus made that is in john chapter 17 he prays that we all may be one he say he prays to god god, god they may be one as we are one he wanted to bring humans into the father father is in us and we in the father there so that there may be one the perichoros is the union that he was talking about so in his incarnation through his message being the very message of god and the messenger of god jesus wanted to bring entire humanity into the complete union with god and we and he has accomplished it so as a priest being the very message he brought the union back and he brought humans back into the same adoration where we are in face to face with god as paul said we are seated in the heavenly places with the father uh, in jesus christ he we brought he brought us in face to face with god into that mouth to mouth intimate adoration and that is how jesus was doing his ministry as prophet priest 
and king. And the goal is very simple. That is to bring people in close adoration to God. And now the Bible calls us royal priesthood. And Bible calls that we are the prophets of God. If you read, uh, we under, if you read Bible, we understand. And every believer of Jesus Christ is also a Christ. This we need to understand. We also are participating in the same ministry of Jesus Christ. Through faith and baptism, we are sharing in the offices of Jesus Christ. And Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. This is talking about the priesthood of believers. The How Jesus, as a priest, brought humans close to God. As Adam, before the fall, lived in close uh, adoration with God, as, as Psalms of Solomon explained, in such a close uh, adoration and uh, relationship. That's what, that's what Jesus has done and uh, he accomplished for us. And as the disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to do the same. Are we bringing people close to God? Or are we people bringing the gap between people and God? Are we bringing people close to God? That's what something we have to introspect ourselves. We are not just believer. We are not called just to believe in Jesus and go to church and worship God in the church. But we are also called to be the priest, to bring the people around us, to bring the people outside the church into close, uh, into close adoration with God. That is what our evangelical work is all about. We need to share our faith. We need to bring people into that close adoration. How can we do that? The answer is very simple. As Jesus said, let your good work, let your light shine among, uh, among the people and let people see your good work and praise your father. Praise God. How are they going to praise? How are we going to bring people into you know, the, uh, the right praise with God into adoration? Through our good works. By, ex by expressing love. By sharing the love that Christ has uh, shared with us. That's how we are going to bring people. And how are we going to bring his kingdom into this world? Because we are the royal priesthood. We are not just the priesthood, but we are royal priesthood. We are children of the king. And we are praying for his kingdom to come. How are we going to do that? When we are in the right place with God. When God's will becomes our will. When we align our hearts with God. When we rely on God. When we uh, submit and surrender our wills, our thoughts, and our desires, our strengths, our, uh, our, our resources and whatever God had given to us. When we surrender them to God, we will be able to to set a culture around us in this true worship and this true praise. And we are going to set this culture, which is going to enlarge. That is how the values of God is going to come into this world. That is why God has placed you and me into the world. God has placed the church in this world so that the church may influence the world around us, bringing the will of God through our work so that the king, God's kingdom values may be established. And uh, how are we going to participate in the ministry of Jesus as a prophet? We are called to proclaim the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. And we are here to share that message of God's love and invite people into his kingdom. And a great pre uh, and a preacher, he said, uh, a modern day preacher, he said, you are the fifth gospel. Sharing gospel is not just by word. Sharing the gospel is through our lives, through our actions. 
and our Jesus, he did not just preach the message of the Father, just like any other pre prophets, but he became he sorry he is the very message of God. What am I trying to say is as evangelist, our the gospel we share is not just by our words. Our lives itself itself should become the gospel. We are the fifth gospel. And uh, early church father said, preach gospel. If required, use words. That is the challenge that we have in front of us. So, we being called the royal priesthood and the prophets of God, we should be participating in the ministry of Jesus as priest, king and the prophet, where he brought us in union with God. And the challenge we have is to bring people close to Jesus so that there may be a mouth-to-mouth -mouth relationship an adoration, a right, intimate relationship between people and God. This is a challenge we have. And I pray that God may grant his grace and strength and spirit so that we may be able to do well in this ministry as priests, prophets, and kings, bringing people into union and oneness with God and bringing the values of God's kingdom uh, and building a culture around us with the values and the will of God and in being influential around us, and we may be a strong church uh, in our community. Thank you very much for listening to me.